Well, after half an hour's drive or so, you're at Northolt Airport. Very businesslike and easy it is too. You can't go wrong. But there was one fellow who thought he could step straight onto the plane just like that. But they collared him. It's all cut and dry. You'd be surprised at the bustle at North Holt. Aeroplanes taking off every few minutes. And the number of different destinations. Oh, the aeroplane that took us. It was a biggish affair, but I don't think it was one of the largest. Yes, two hours after you step on at North Holt, you're there. Watch and ward in the air highlights the training involved in becoming a flying boat pilot. The technique of handling a flying boat on the water is quite different from that of handling a land plane on the ground. Many new problems are introduced concerning the depth and state of the surface of the water and the strength and direction of the tide. So the flying boat pupils keep on taking off, landing and taxiing until they can do so perfectly under different conditions of wind, tide and water. After this, they go on to larger three-engine machines and a test flight is made to an unknown harbour. The mooring rope is cast off and the flying boat taxis away for the takeoff. But the archive collection also includes more recent films, like Number One in Europe, a promotional film for BEA giving a fascinating insight into the airline's operations and its vast European route network. What lies behind this simple booking? Well, it's anything but simple. In fact, it's Beacon, a vast computer complex which gives the BEA network an immediate reservation system and coordinates the many requests that make up a total service for business and holiday travellers. Returning by BE-023 from Orly on the 19th. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of British European Airways. You can also see history in the making, memorable first flights. The Viscount prototype ran on scheduled BEA passenger services from North Holt to the continent and on internal routes. Among the passengers on the first flight to Paris are Sir Frank Whittle, jet engine pioneer, and Mr George Edwards, designer of the Viscount. Meanwhile, well, perhaps the less said about the customs, the better. To celebrate the historic occasion, BEA refunded the fare to the lucky first passenger to travel by propeller turbine airliner. BEA's Viscounts, by the way, will be known as the Discovery class. Then, suddenly, she was no longer a number on the books, but the Comet her shapely silver moving into a still July evening in 1949 to take the air for the first time. It was a great moment for all who had planned and sponsored her. There was Sir Frank Whittle, pioneer of jet propulsion. There, the creators of the comet and its engine. There at the controls, John Cunningham. A great moment, but an anxious moment too. Many hundreds of skilled men, the best brains and hands in the business, had put their utmost into her. What snags could possibly develop? And yet, you kept your fingers crossed. 
The aeroplane came into being when Orville and Wilbur Wright made the first flight over the sand dunes of North Carolina on December the 17th, 1903. Much of the secret of their success lay in the method of control, the result of years of research and of experiment. The conquest of the air has always worked at an accelerated pace. Only six years later, Louis Blériot crossed the English Channel and showed how the new transport could break down the isolation of nations. The first commercial use of the aeroplane in England was in 1911, when Gustav Hamel operated for a week the first official airmail service. He carried 130,000 letters and postcards between Hendon and Windsor. In 1914, aircraft was still in an early stage of development. The war, however, forced a rapid progress and turned the aeroplane into a weapon of destruction. But nevertheless, far-sighted men realized its potentiality for developing imperial relationships. To this end, therefore, the government paused for a moment in the business of war and appointed in 1917 the Civil Aerial Transport Committee to report on the steps which should be taken to develop aviation for civil and commercial purposes from a domestic and imperial standpoint. And its report laid the foundations of British air transport. By the end of the war, the aeroplane had begun to establish itself as a recognized vehicle, so much so that the Royal Air Force started to operate mail services between London, Paris, and Cologne using converted military aeroplanes. The regularity and efficiency of these services was of a high order. A night mail service was also begun between Folkestone and Cologne. The development of the Empire air routes was one of the major recommendations of the committee of 1917. After the armistice, the Royal Air Force began to survey the routes of the future and many notable flights were made. In 1921, the service began to operate a mail route between Cairo and Baghdad. In the immediate post-war years, it was the individual pioneer who largely inspired the development of air transport as we know it today, and a great tribute should be paid to their courage and imagination. In 1919, following the crossing of the Atlantic in easy stages by a United States flying boat, the first direct flight across was made by the late Captain John Olcock with Lieutenant Arthur Whitten Brown in a converted Vimy bomber. In the same year, the British airship, the R-34, with a crew of 30, made a double crossing of this ocean. The success of this voyage had the result of focusing attention for many years on the potentialities of the airship. On the 25th of August, Aircraft Transport and Travel Limited began a regular daily service between London and Paris. A week later, Handley Page Transport began to operate on the same route and shortly afterwards opened a regular service between London and Brussels. In October, the ship owners, Samuel Inston and company, started a private service between Cardiff, London, and Paris. Later, this was operated as a public one, together with a service to Brussels and Cologne. Developments came fast in that year, for it was an age of great individual flights. And in the winter, Captain Ross Smith and his brother, Lieutenant Keith Smith, made the first flight between England and Australia, taking 30 days. In the spring of 1920, Croydon Airport was open for the operation of cross-channel air services. Between 1920 and 1924, Handy Page Transport, Daimler Hire, Instant Airlines, and the British Marine Air Navigation Company maintained services at a loss in competition with heavily subsidized foreign airlines. By 1924, the position had become so serious that the government appointed a committee later known as the Hamling Committee, to report on the methods of putting British air transport on a sound footing. This committee recommended that if British air transport were to survive, let alone develop, then one company and one alone must be entrusted with the task. This report led to the formation of Imperial Airways on March the 31st, 1924, as the chosen instrument of the government with the mandate to develop British air transport on an economic basis. Almost at once, daily services were started by Imperial Airways between London and Paris, Cologne, Baal, and Zurich. A service was also open between Southampton and the Channel Islands with small flying boats. The fact was appreciated that air services could not compete with other forms of transport unless reliability could be ensured and comparable passenger comfort be provided. To this end, therefore, in the winter of its first year, Imperial Airways commissioned the world's first three-engined airliner the 14-passenger City of Washington.
The first steps were also taken to develop regular Empire Air services. Sir Alan Cobham and the late Sir Sefton Branker made a survey flight between England, India and Burma and a party representing the Air Ministry and Imperial Airways made a survey of the route between Cairo and Karachi. 1926 was notable for bringing more large aircraft into operation. In March, one three-engined and four twin-engined Handley Page airliners were commissioned. In the same year, the first of the three-engined Argosy class opened the silver wing service between London and Paris. These aeroplanes had accommodation for 20 passengers and a catering service was supplied. In December, the first regular Empire service was established with the opening of a fortnightly mail and passenger route between Cairo and Basra. The Hercules class was commissioned on this route. In 1927, plans were laid for further Empire services when Sir Alan Cobham made a 20,000 mile survey flight around Africa. 1928 began with the first Empire services from England when the route from London to Karachi was opened. In May, Lady Maud Hoare, the wife of the Secretary of State for Air, opened the rebuilt airport at Croydon. In July, the three-engine Calcutta flying boats began to fly the trans-Mediterranean section of the India service. 1929 was a year of planning and consolidation. The service from London to Karachi was extended to Jodhpur and Delhi. 1931 was one of great advance. At the end of February, following surveys of the Cairo to Cape Town air route, a weekly service was begun between England and Mwanza in Central Africa. To operate the trans-Mediterranean section of the Indian route, a new type of flying boat was commissioned in the spring, the four-engine Scipio. She foreshadowed the big flying boats that were to come later. In 1931, the Hannibal Heracles class of airliner was put into service. These were the first four-engined airliners in the world and had a standard of comfort and quietness which had never been approached before. In the January of 1932, the weekly service to Central Africa was extended to Cape Town for the carriage of mail and in April for passengers. In this year, the late Edward Hillman laid the foundations of his air transport business with a service between Romford and Clacton. Later in the year, a new type of land plane was put into service on the Empire routes, the Atalanta, a four-engine fast monoplane. <laughs> In October, the route to India was diverted to the Arabian side of the Persian Gulf. The value of internal air services in Great Britain was beginning to be appreciated, and in the March of 1933, Highland Airways was formed to operate in northern Scotland. Services were run between Inverness, Aberdeen, Wick, and Orkney, and Shetland. Then Hillman Airways began a daily service between London and Paris, and Spartan Airlines was formed to operate a service linking London and the Isle of Wight. In May and June, the first steps in the opening of the Empire route to Australia by Imperial Airways were taken when the Air Superintendent, Major Brackley, made a survey flight to Australia. The formation in June of Indian Transcontinental Airways marked a further step. This was the first of several companies associated with Imperial Airways founded to satisfy the national aspirations of the countries through which air services passed. The close of the year 1933 saw the England-India service extended to Calcutta, Rangoon and Singapore. The next step towards the goal of uniting England and Australia by air was taken in the January of 1934 when the Australian company, Qantas Empire Airways, was formed to operate the route from Singapore to Australia. In March, the four British railway companies and Imperial Airways founded railway air services to operate internal services in Great Britain. In May, the Scylla class of airliner began to operate on the London to Paris route. At the end of May, Highland Airways began running the first British internal air mail service when they were awarded a contract for the carriage of unsurcharged mail between Inverness and Kirkwall. The aeroplane was rapidly bringing to Scotland a new means of communication between isolated centres of population and this young company was doing sterling work. Later in the year, Imperial Airways introduced the Diana class of airliner to operate certain European routes. They were then the fastest airliners in the British Empire. At the end of the year, an important advance was made. For a flat, 
and reduced rate was introduced for air mail along the Empire routes. This meant that the advantages of rapid air services were being thrown open to a much wider circle of people than before, and so proved once more the value of the aeroplane to the Empire. Almost at the same time, Australia was brought closer to Britain when the route to Singapore was extended to Brisbane. The year 1934 closed with a plan that was to be a vital service to imperial relations. In December, the government, which had been considering for some time the future of British air transport and how best it might benefit the Empire, announced the Empire Air Mail Programme, whereby, as soon as possible, all letters and postcards dispatched from the United Kingdom for delivery along the Empire routes would be carried by air without surcharge. Furthermore, the government said that Imperial Airways was to be its chosen instrument for the execution of this program. It entailed a vast expansion in the organization of the Empire Air Routes. New airliners, new airports, wireless stations, and the other myriad things which go to the making of an air service. In fact, the company was required to effect a revolution in its services and at the same time carry on with its existing operations. The end of the year was marked by the further drawing together of Scotland with the formation of Northern and Scottish Airways to operate a service between Glasgow, Campbelltown, and Isla. Later services were opened between Glasgow and the Isle of Man, and one was begun between Glasgow and Skye. This was later extended to the Outer Hebrides. 1935 saw the development of the routes to the continent and a great increase in the frequency of the Empire services. In the spring, Imperial Airways began a daily service between London, Brussels, Cologne, Prague, Vienna, and Budapest. All these developments made an increasing demand for personnel. And in June, Imperial Airways opened a school for the training of navigation officers and other ranks. United Airways was formed to operate services connecting London with Blackpool, the Isle of Man, Liverpool, and Leeds. Further continental developments were made by other companies. Hillman Airways opened a service between London and Brussels, and British Continental Airways began on the same route a month later. At the end of the year, a new company came into the air transport field. When Hillman Airways, United Airways, and Spartan Airlines were amalgamated and became British Airways. In November, British Continental Airways opened a service between London and Amsterdam, and early in 1936, this service was extended to Hamburg, Copenhagen, and Stockholm. The early part of 1936 was marked by further links in the system of empire communications. In February, Imperial Airways started a weekly service between England and West Africa to Kano in Nigeria. Later in the year, this was extended to Lagos. In March, a weekly service was opened between London and Hong Kong. At the same time, British Airways opened a mail service between London and Malmo and later extended it to Stockholm. Early in this year, the agreement between the South African government and Imperial Airways expired, and South African Airways took over the operation of all services south of Johannesburg. In the summer, the coming of the flying boat routes of the future was heralded by a survey flight made by Major Brackley of the route between Singapore and Sydney. At the same time, British Airways began operating a night freight and mail service between London and Cologne and Hanover in conjunction with the German Airways. This service was later extended to Berlin. In August, British Airways absorbed British Continental Airways. This gave them an important grouping of European services and made them the second largest British air transport company. The year 1936 closed with the commissioning of Canopus, the first of a fleet of 28 Imperial flying boats built to operate the services required for the Empire Air Mail program. She and her sisters went into commission on the Trans-Mediterranean section of the Empire routes. In March the next year, 1937, a new base was opened at Hythe on Southampton Water for the operation of the Empire services. In April, British Airways commissioned the Lockheed Electras on their London Paris and London to Scandinavia services. <laughs> During May and June, a changeover was made on the African route from land airliners to Imperial flying boats. The main route was diverted from Kisumu to follow the East African coast to Durban, while the internal service to Johannesburg was maintained by Wilson Airways and Rhodesia and Nyasaland Airways in association with Imperial Airways. 
In June, a service was begun by Imperial Airways between New York and Bermuda in conjunction with Pan American Airways. This service was operated by the Imperial Flying Boat, the Cavalier, and the Pan American Airways, the Bermuda Clipper. On the 29th of June, the Empire Air Mail program was inaugurated on the England South African service, whereby all letters and postcards between England and the Empire territories in Africa were carried without surcharge and without an air mail label. About the same time, British Airways opened a school for the training of its flying personnel. A remarkable device known as the Link Trainer is in use for blind flying instruction. The scene now shifts to the North Atlantic, and in the summer of 1937, a series of commercial survey flights were made across this ocean by Imperial flying boats and Pan American clippers. Only 18 years ago, the first sensational crossing had been made. Now, a series of flights were made on prearranged time schedules. Altogether, Imperial Airways made 10 crossings of this ocean during the summer. In August, Scottish Airways was formed to take over the services of Northern and Scottish Airways and Highland Airways. Survey flights by Imperial flying boats along the England-India route were made in September and October and led to the first flying boat service between Southampton and Karachi. In October, the Imperial Airways West African service was extended from Lagos to Accra. The Imperial flying boat, Centaurus, made a survey flight between England and Australia and New Zealand to prepare the way for service across the Tasman Sea between Sydney and Auckland. We were now at the beginning of transoceanic flying. One of the biggest difficulties to be faced is the economic one. This problem is linked with the one of takeoff, for every aeroplane needs more power to enable it to leave the ground or the water than is required to maintain it in flight. This in turn means the commercial load has to be sacrificed to allow the weight of increased power plant and fuel with a consequent risk of uneconomic operation. For some years, Imperial Airways had been considering methods of overcoming this problem. One was by the use of the short Mayo composite aircraft, whereby a heavily loaded seaplane is assisted into the air by a parent flying boat and released when the aerodynamic forces tending to separate them are of sufficient magnitude. In the summer of 1937, trials began with the composite aircraft, and in February of the following year, the first separation trials were made which proved successful. The other method of overcoming this problem was by refueling in the air, and tests were conducted at the beginning of 1938 and are still proceeding. In February, the Empire Air Mail program was inaugurated between England and India and Malaya, and Imperial flying boats began operating between Karachi and Singapore and shortly afterwards between Singapore and Sydney. In June, a service was opened between Freetown and Bathurst by Elders Colonial Airways, a company in association with Imperial Airways. Shortly after, the Mercury, the upper component of the short mail composite marine aircraft, flew from Foynes to Montreal, making the fastest east to west crossing of the North Atlantic, the first commercial flight over the North Atlantic by a heavier than air machine, and the first direct flight between Britain and Montreal. In July, the Empire Air Mail program was extended to Sydney and then to Hong Kong. A modified type of Imperial flying boat was launched for use on the North Atlantic Mail Service and on the projected service between Sydney and Auckland. It was in September of this year that the aeroplane demonstrated its striking ability to improve relationships when, during the European crisis, British Airways carried Mr. Neville Chamberlain on his three visits to Germany to confer with the German Chancellor. About the same time, the Mercury, the upper component of the composite aircraft, was released from the parent flying boat, the Maya, over Dundee, and made a non-stop flight of 6,000 miles to the Orange River in southwest Africa, so establishing a world long-distance record for seaplanes. In October 1938, a Lockheed 14 airliner of British Airways made the first survey flight between England and Lisbon on the proposed service linking England with Portugal, West Africa, and South America. In December, a second survey flight was made to Lisbon and then continued as far as Bathurst in Gambia. In 1938, Imperial Airways carried 2,000 tons of mail. 
the largest amount ever handled by an air transport company. At the end of this year, the Secretary of State for Air announced that proposals will shortly be laid before the House of Commons for the formation of a public corporation to take over the interests of Imperial Airways and British Airways. In April 1939, as a prelude to this step, a reorganization of the European routes was made. British Airways took over the operation of certain European services formerly operated by Imperial Airways, and both companies began to operate jointly the London-Paris services with Frobisher airliners. At the same time, British Airways began running services between London and Brussels, London and Budapest, London, Berlin, and Warsaw. Before leaving on the first service to Warsaw, Sir Francis Shelmadine, the Director General of Civil Aviation, said, Today marks a great step forward in the progress of British civil aviation. For it marks not only this new service to Berlin and Warsaw, but the service by British Airways to Budapest. I'm sure that we wish the company all possible success. Railway air services began in May, faster services of greater frequency between London and the chief provincial towns. In June, Imperial Airways head office was moved to the new building in Victoria. Now under construction is the Ferry FC-1 pressure cabin class of airliner, the design of which was based on the experience of British Airways. At the present time, the new 34-ton Golden Hind class of flying boats for Imperial Airways are nearly ready for their trials before being put into service on the North Atlantic route. So ends our story for the time being. Paris, but 70 minutes from London. Zurich, three and a half hours. Warsaw, six and a half hours. Egypt, but 30 hours. India is now only three days away. South Africa, five days and Australia, eight days. <laughs>